Growing up, I was the quintessential middle school hero. I had charisma, wit, and a face that got the attention of all the girls. I was popular, the center of attention, and life was a breeze. But then high school hit like a freight train, and my once clear skin turned into a battleground of acne. It was like the universe had conspired against me, and my self-esteem plummeted faster than a lead balloon. As the pimples flourished, so did my waistline. Stress eating became my solace, and before I knew it, I was the loner at the back of the class, invisible to everyone but the relentless mockery of my peers. Friends vanished like mist, and I was left alone with my oily skin and burgeoning self-pity. Bullying was a constant shadow looming over my high school years, an ever-present reminder of my perceived flaws. The first event that etched itself into my memory was during a lunch break, when a group of jocks led by Kirk McCoy, the leader of the bunch, cornered me in the hallway. Their jeers cut deeper than any knife, mocking my appearance with cruel taunts and derisive laughter. I stood frozen, unable to escape the onslaught of their words. The humiliation burned like acid, searing into my soul. Another harrowing incident unfolded during a class presentation where I summoned the courage to stand before my peers hoping to prove my worth. But as soon as I opened my mouth, the whispers began, a chorus of ridicule that drowned out my voice, suffocating me with its venomous spite. My cheeks burned with shame as laughter echoed through the room, each mocking laugh a dagger to my already wounded pride. I stumbled through my presentation as if walking through shards of glass, I wished the ground would swallow me whole and spare me further humiliation. The final straw came during a school dance, where I mustered the courage to ask a girl to be my date, hoping against hope for a sliver of acceptance. But as I approached her, a group of popular kids intercepted me, their sneers cutting through the air like a whip. They mocked my appearance, ridiculing me for daring to step out of my place, crushing my fragile confidence with their callous words. The girl I had hoped to impress turned away in disgust, leaving me standing alone in a sea of mocking faces, feeling smaller than I ever thought possible. That was when I resigned myself to my fate. As high school wore on, the shadows of bullying and isolation grew thicker, wrapping around me like a suffocating cloak. I retreated further into myself, days blurred into nights, a monotonous cycle of loneliness and longing for acceptance. It was during these bleak months that I stumbled upon a peculiar hobby, one that would become my sanctuary amidst the chaos of teenage angst. Taxidermy, the art of preserving and mounting animal specimens, captivated me with its intricate craftsmanship and the sense of control it offered over life and death. In the quiet solitude of my basement, I found refuge in the delicate precision of sculpting forms from lifeless flesh. Each stroke of my hand a cathartic release of pent-up emotion. As I delicately stitched together the fabric of skin and bone, I felt a sense of purpose awaken within me, a connection to something greater than myself. With each creature I brought back from the brink of oblivion, I felt a glimmer of hope flicker in the darkness, a reminder that beauty could be found even in the most unexpected places. In the silent company of my creations, I found a sense of belonging, that had eluded me in the harsh glare of the outside world. Through taxidermy, I discovered a sanctuary where judgment held no sway, where I could sculpt my own reality with steady hands and unwavering determination. I accepted my solitary lifestyle. That is, until she entered my life. In the beginning of my senior year, a glimmer of hope emerged in the form of a new arrival to our small town, a girl whose quiet grace and gentle demeanor belied a strength that seemed to defy her delicate appearance. She was a breath of fresh air amidst the stale confines of high school hierarchy. She was a light that cut through the darkness. I saw my chance to rewrite the narrative of my own story. With a heart pounding with equal parts anticipation and trepidation, I offered to show her around the school, hoping that she wouldn't recoil at my appearance and the whispers and snickers that followed me like a shadow. To my surprise, she accepted with a smile that warmed the depths of my soul, her eyes devoid of judgment or prejudice. As we wandered the halls together, I couldn't help but notice the stares or dirty looks that trailed in our wake. But she remained unfazed, 
her presence a shield against the arrows of contempt that threatened to pierce my fragile facade. It wasn't until we reached the sanctuary of an empty classroom that she finally voiced the question that had been lingering unspoken between us. With a furrowed brow and a hint of concern in her voice, she asked why they treated me that way, the lingering stigma that seemed to follow me like a curse. I hesitated, but as I met her gaze, I confessed the truth. The acne, the weight, the constant torment, all of it had beaten me down. I told her I had given up. To my astonishment, she didn't recoil in horror or turn away in disgust. Instead, she gave me a smile, offering me a lifeline amidst the self-doubt and insecurity. She shook my hand and said, well, you have a friend now. As our friendship blossomed, I found myself opening up to Victoria in ways I never thought possible. It was during one of our heartfelt conversations that I mentioned my peculiar hobby of taxidermy, a passion that had become my sanctuary amidst the chaos of high school. To my surprise, her eyes lit up with genuine interest, her curiosity piqued by the prospect of exploring this hidden world with me. So, one fateful afternoon, I invited her over to my humble abode, nerves tingling with anticipation as I led her down to the basement, where my makeshift studio lay in wait. I had braced myself for her reaction, half expecting her to run out in horror at the sight of the preserved specimens that lined the shelves like silent sentinels. But, to my surprise, she greeted my collection with an enthusiasm that mirrored my own, her eyes alight with a newfound sense of wonder. With eager hands, she examined each specimen with a reverence that bordered on obsession, asking questions and soaking up knowledge like a sponge. As we delved deeper into the world of taxidermy, I found myself teaching her everything I knew, sharing the secrets of my craft. And to my delight, she proved to be a quick study. Her hands steady and sure as she sculpted forms from clay and breathed life into lifeless hides. In the quiet confines of my basement sanctuary, we bonded over our shared passion, lost in the dance of creation and exploration. As we stood side by side, admiring the fruits of our labor, I felt a sense of camaraderie that transcended the boundaries of friendship. In her, I had found not only a kindred spirit, but also a fellow artist, a partner in crime whose creativity matched my own. As I gazed upon her creations, each one a masterpiece in its own right, I knew that I had found a friend for life a soulmate bound to me, not by blood or obligation, but through a shared passion. The days stretched into weeks, and the weeks into months. The time we spent together made all those years of torment and isolation fade away. But as the saying goes, all good things must come to an end. One day, without warning or explanation, she stopped talking to me altogether. I tried to approach her, but she was always surrounded by a new circle of friends who cast wary glances in my direction blocking any attempts at reconciling with her. Once again, I found myself retreating into the familiar embrace of loneliness, the shadows of my past closing in around me like a suffocating shroud. But this time, the solitude felt heavier, more oppressive, weighed down by what once was a beautiful friendship, even my beloved hobby of taxidermy. Once a sanctuary amidst the chaos of high school, had become tainted by her absence. Each preserved specimen served as a painful reminder of the bond we had shared, a silent witness to the memories we had created together. And try as I might, I could no longer find solace in the delicate precision of sculpting forms from lifeless flesh. The once familiar rhythm of my craft now tinged with bittersweet nostalgia. In her absence, the world seemed colder, harsher, devoid of warmth or light. I couldn't help but wonder if things could ever go back to how they were before. I quickly dismissed the thought and accepted my fate so I could forget. But deep down I knew that some wounds never truly heal, leaving behind scars that serve as constant reminders of the pain we endure in the pursuit of connection and belonging. As I braced myself for the onslaught of renewed bullying now that Victoria no longer had my back, a strange phenomenon unfolded before my eyes. I was met with silence instead of scorn. It was as if the universe had decided to spare me the agony of further torment, leaving me to languish in a purgatory of indifference. At first, I welcomed the respite from the constant barrage of ridicule and mockery, grateful for the chance to fade into the background and become little more than a ghost haunting the halls of my high school. But as days turned into weeks, the silence grew deafening, suffocating me with its oppressive weight. 
I became a mere observer in the intricate dance of the high school hierarchy, a silent witness to the shifting alliances and dramas that played out before me. With each passing day, I made note of the complex web of relationships that bound my classmates together. I was a silent observer, unnoticed and uninvolved. In my solitude, I found solace in adopting the guise of a scientist studying animals in their natural habitat. I meticulously cataloged each clique and circle of friends, noting who was on good terms, who was dating who, and who were embroiled in bitter conflict. It was a game of social chess, played out on a battlefield of teenage angst and insecurity. The group Victoria hung out with grew and shrunk, but the core was always the same seven students, including Victoria. I referred to them as the Sinister Seven. Every one of the kids she hung out with had tormented me throughout my high school years. Why did she choose to befriend them of all people? As the school year progressed, a strange and unsettling pattern emerged. A series of disappearances sent ripples throughout the community. It began with Kirk McCoy, the popular jock whose taunts had once been a daily ritual, a relentless barrage of cruelty that had left me battered and bruised, both physically and emotionally. He was part of the seven. His absence left a void in the social fabric of our school. The halls were quieter and the mood somber for weeks. If I had gone missing, I doubt my teachers would have noticed during roll call. Both students and faculty spread theories and rumors of what had happened to him. They couldn't be further from the truth. And then came the disappearance of Susie Wheeler, the mastermind behind a vicious smear campaign that had tarnished my reputation and left me a pariah in the eyes of my peers. She was also part of the Sinister Seven. In the weeks that followed, like clockwork, four more faces disappeared from the ranks of our student body, each one a perpetrator of cruelty and malice towards me, and a member of the Seven. And while I couldn't say that I felt sad about their sudden absence, there was an undeniable sense of disquiet that settled over me like a thick fog, obscuring the boundaries between right and wrong. But it wasn't just their disappearances that unsettled me. It was the way people started to look at me, their eyes filled with a mixture of fear and suspicion. Whispers followed me wherever I went, the air thick with unspoken accusations and half-formed rumors. And while I tried to brush off the newfound attention, I couldn't shake the feeling that people thought I was involved somehow. Maybe they were right. I found myself unsure of who to trust or where to turn. I remember it vividly, the knock on the door that shattered the fragile illusion of normalcy that I had at home. With both of my parents busy working, I found myself alone, grappling with the sudden intrusion of two police officers on my doorstep. They asked if they could come in, their expressions grave and their eyes scanning the room with a sense of urgency that sent a chill down my spine. I knew why they were there, of course. The disappearances of my former tormentors had cast a shadow of suspicion over me painting me as a potential suspect in the eyes of the law. And yet, despite knowing better, I let them in, a sense of dread pooling in the pit of my stomach as they made their way through our modest home. One of the officers took a seat in the living room, his gaze piercing as he questioned me about the missing kids, while the other began to search the house, his footsteps echoing ominously in the silence that followed. It wasn't long before he made his way to the basement, and the sound of his startled yell echoed through the house like a gunshot. Heart pounding, I followed the officer, who had been questioning me, down into the depths of the basement, where he stood frozen in shock at the sight before him. The walls were lined with preserved specimens, their glassy eyes staring back at us with a silent intensity that sent a shiver down my spine. Taxidermy had been my sanctuary, my refuge from the cruelty of the outside world, but now it stood as a silent witness to the chaos that had engulfed my life. With a trembling voice, I explained to the officers that taxidermy was merely a hobby of mine, a passion passed down from my uncle, who was an avid hunter. I assured them that I had obtained the specimens legally and that there was no foul play involved. After a few more tense minutes of searching and questioning, the officers seemed satisfied with my explanation, and they left as suddenly as they had arrived, leaving me alone in the suffocating silence of my own home. The days dragged on at school, every day more agonizing than the last as the whispers and stares followed me like a dark cloud. It seemed that the suspicion and fear that had gripped the town had seeped into the very walls of our school. 
casting me as a pariah to be avoided at all costs. I felt more alone than I had ever felt before. At lunchtime, the cafeteria echoed with the clatter of trays and the murmur of conversation. But there was no place for me among the throngs of students. No one sat at my table, not even the other outcasts and misfits who had once been my companions in loneliness. I was a solitary figure amidst a sea of faces, adrift in a world that had turned its back on me. And then, just when I had resigned myself to the solitude that seemed to define my existence, she appeared, a light in the darkness, her smile a ray of hope amidst the gloom. With a sense of disbelief, I watched as she approached my table, her eyes filled with a warmth and kindness that I had long since forgotten. Mind if I sit with you? she asked, her voice breaking through the silence like a gentle breeze. I was dumbfounded, unable to comprehend why she would choose to associate herself with someone like me. But as she took a seat across from me, her presence a balm to my wounded soul. I realized that perhaps I wasn't as alone as I had once thought. Together we sat in silence, sharing the moment as the rest of the world faded into the background. The whispers and stares of those who had cast me aside no longer mattered. As the final bell of the day rang out, signaling the end of another long and arduous day, I mustered up the courage to ask her the question that had been weighing heavily on my mind. Hey, do you want to come over to my place and hang out? We can talk taxidermy, I suggested tentatively, my heart hammering in my chest as I awaited her response. To my surprise and delight, she agreed without hesitation, her eyes sparkling with a newfound excitement that mirrored my own. My heart skipped a beat at her eagerness, a glimmer of hope igniting within me as we made our way to my humble abode. It was like old times, almost as if the events of the past few months had never transpired. As we settled into the familiar surroundings of my home, surrounded by the comforting embrace of my taxidermy creations, I couldn't help but feel a sense of anticipation building within me. I wanted to know why she had stopped talking to me, why she had drifted away without a word of explanation. But I was afraid, afraid of scaring her away and driving her further from me. But as we delved into the world of taxidermy once more, the barriers between us seemed to melt away, replaced by an easy camaraderie that felt like coming home. She commented on the lack of new projects, and I couldn't bring myself to tell her the truth that I had lost my inspiration in the wake of her absence, that the joy I had once found in my craft had dimmed without her by my side. But she seemed to sense my hesitation, her smile gentle and understanding, as she made a promise that filled me with a sense of warmth and gratitude. Tomorrow I want to make it up to you. It's a surprise, she said with a grin. We spent another hour lost in conversation. It felt like the darkness that had engulfed me had finally begun to recede replaced by the promise of a brighter tomorrow. The following day dawned with a sense of anticipation that quickly gave way to confusion and disappointment as I realized that she wasn't in school. My heart sank like a stone in my chest, the weight of her absence pressing down on me with an unbearable heaviness. I had thought that everything was back to the way it was before, that we had found our way back to each other in spite of everything that had happened. But now, as I navigated the crowded hallways alone, the whispers grew louder, the stares more intense, and the jocks seemed to take a perverse pleasure in running into me as they passed by. Other students began to ask where Victoria was, their curiosity and concern only serving to deepen the sense of isolation that had settled over me like a suffocating shroud. I lowered my gaze and quickened my pace, desperate to escape the prying eyes and probing questions that seemed to follow me wherever I went. Even the teachers who had once taken pity on me treated me with a cold indifference, ignoring me or refusing to meet my gaze as I stumbled through the motions of the school day in a daze. It was as if the world had conspired against me, closing in on all sides with its relentless scrutiny and judgment. And as I retreated further into myself, seeking solace in the quiet confines of my own mind, I couldn't help but wonder what had gone wrong, what had caused her to disappear once again without a word of explanation. But amidst the chaos and confusion, one thing remained painfully clear. I was alone once more, adrift at sea, with no one to turn to and nowhere to go. With a mixture of trepidation and determination swirling in my chest, I made the decision to walk to her home. I needed to know if she was okay, if there was a reason behind her sudden absence from school. 
As I approached her front door, my heart pounded in my ears, each step heavier than the last. I raised my hand and knocked on the door, half expecting her parents to answer, ready to deliver the blow that she didn't want to see me, or that she wasn't there. But when the door swung open, my breath caught in my throat as I found myself face to face with her, a smile gracing her lips that banished all of my fears in an instant. Without a word, she pulled me into her home, her touch sending shivers down my spine as she led me down to the basement. It was the first time I'd ever been to her house, and I couldn't help but feel a sense of unease wash over me as I took in the unfamiliar surroundings. My mind raced with a million questions and uncertainties. I wasn't ready for this. I had never even kissed anyone, let alone found myself alone with a girl in her basement. But as she turned to face me, her eyes filled with a warmth and kindness that melted away my fears. I knew that I was exactly where I was meant to be. As I descended the stairs, preparing myself for the unknown, a familiar smell greeted my senses, instantly calming my nerves. The scent of preserved specimens filled the air, mingling with the musty aroma of the basement. I glanced around, my eyes widening in amazement at the sight before me, her collection of taxidermies. Each one was a testament to her skill and dedication. As I made my way through the spacious basement, I couldn't help but marvel at how far she had come since we had first bonded over our shared passion. Each specimen was meticulously crafted, every detail rendered with precision and care. I felt a swell of pride rise within me as I admired her work, a grin spreading across my face at the thought of how much she had accomplished. She watched me with a knowing smile, her eyes alight with anticipation, as she beckoned me closer. Come see my best work, she said, her voice filled with excitement. It's back here. I followed her eagerly. My curiosity piqued by the prospect of witnessing her masterpiece. She disappeared behind a curtain, and without hesitation, I followed, my heart pounding in anticipation of what lay beyond. As I stepped through the curtain, my heart plummeted to the pit of my stomach as I realized that she wasn't alone. A group of students from our high school stood before me, their eyes filled with malice and amusement as they stared at me. I felt a cold chill run down my spine as I understood the truth. I had been set up. I looked to my friend, searching for some semblance of understanding or remorse, but her grin had only widened, a twisted reflection of the warmth and kindness I had once seen in her eyes. She had orchestrated this entire charade, luring me into her trap with false promises and hollow gestures. The realization hit me like a sledgehammer, shattering the fragile illusion of hope that had sustained me through the darkest days of my loneliness. I had dared to hope for a happy ending, for a chance at redemption and reconciliation. But now I saw the truth for what it was, a cruel joke of my existence. What's wrong? She asked innocently, her voice tinged with feigned concern. Don't you like my present to you? How could she be so cruel, so heartless? This was no present. This was a betrayal, a violation of the trust and friendship that had once bound us together. And as the laughter of my tormentors echoed through my mind, I resigned myself to my fate. But moments passed and no one said a word. They were quiet as their eyes were focused on me. I forced myself to make eye contact. Their expressions unchanged. When I looked closer at each one of them, my jaw dropped as I stood there. Staring at the students before me, a chill ran down my spine. I recognized each and every one of them. They were the missing kids, the ones who had tormented me the most throughout my high school life. All six of them, frozen in place like statues, their eyes vacant but malevolent as ever. But then, something strange happened. I took a step towards them and then another, but they didn't so much as flinch. It was as if they were oblivious to my presence, their gazes fixed on some unseen horizon remaining motionless like mannequins. A sense of unease crept over me, twisting in the pit of my stomach like a serpent coiled in weight. Something wasn't right here. Something was terribly wrong. And as I stood there, trapped in a surreal nightmare, I turned to her. A sickening dread washed over me like a tidal wave, threatening to drown me in its suffocating embrace. She asked what I thought of her human taxidermy specimens. Her voice laced with a chilling nonchalance that sent shivers down my spine. I stood there, speechless, unable to comprehend the horror of her words, 
as she described in gruesome detail how she had crafted each one. She spoke of them as if they were nothing more than objects to be manipulated and controlled, their deaths a means to an end in her twisted pursuit of perfection. She explained how she had ensured that none of them were physically damaged when she had ended their lives, ensuring that they were as lifelike as possible in death. My mind reeled with the sheer depravity of her actions, the cruelty of her words. A dagger plunged deep into my heart, and it, but it was her final revelation that filled me with a bone-chilling terror beyond anything I had ever known. She had preserved the clothes they were wearing at the time of their deaths, a macabre reminder of the lives they had once led before she had snuffed them out like candles in the dark. In that moment, as the full extent of her depravity became clear to me, I realized that I was standing in the presence of a monster, a creature of pure darkness and malice who had hidden behind a mask of friendship and kindness. And as the truth of her actions sank in, I knew that I was in grave danger. As her words pierced the heavy silence, I struggled to find my voice, to form the words to express the sheer revulsion and disgust coursing through my veins. You don't like them, do you? She asked, her tone tinged with a hint of uncertainty. There are a few things I wish I could have done better. After all, I'm not as experienced as you, but I was hoping you'd be happy with my progress. Her words hit me like a sledgehammer. How could she stand there, so casually discussing the desecration of human life as if it were nothing more than a hobby, a mere curiosity to be indulged and explored? I felt a surge of bile rise in my throat, threatening to choke me with its bitter taste. How could she expect me to be happy with her progress, to condone such unfathomable acts of cruelty and violence? And yet, as I looked into her eyes, I saw no hint of remorse or regret, only a cold indifference that sent shivers down my spine. In that moment, I knew that I had to get out of there, to escape from this house of horrors before it swallowed me whole. But as I turned to leave, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was leaving behind more than just a friend. A part of myself had died in that basement. Why did you kill them? I asked her, my voice trembling with a mixture of fear and disbelief. They hurt you, she replied, her tone eerily calm. You're my friend, so I confronted them. I told them to leave you alone. They said they would stop, and I believed them. They were nice to me. One of the girls even invited me to her home to hang out. I thought it'd be nice to have a female friend. But when I got to her home, they were all there. She turned to face the group of six behind her, her gaze unfaltering, and said, After what they did to me, I thought my life was over. I couldn't face you, so I stayed away. She continued and explained what transpired, which was sickening. I felt a sense of rage well up inside me at the six who stood before me. I threw myself into my taxidermy because it reminded me of you, she said. It was the only thing that kept me from going insane. The love of taxidermy eventually brought me back. That's when I had the idea for the perfect taxidermy project. As she spoke, she explained in detail how she had lured them one by one and ended their lives. Her demeanor was cold and methodical devoid of any hint of remorse or emotion. And as I listened to her recount her actions, I couldn't help but feel a sense of sickening admiration for the twisted brilliance of her plan. I listened intently to everything she had to say, each word weighing heavily on my soul as the full extent of her actions unfolded before me. When she was finished, I looked up at the group of six. Disgust churned within me as I regarded them, their lifeless forms serving as grotesque trophies in a tableau of horror. Turning my gaze back to my friend, I felt a maelstrom of conflicting emotions swirling within me. Anger, betrayal, and a sickening fascination with the depths of her depravity. But amidst the chaos of my thoughts, there was a begrudging admiration for the skill and precision with which she had executed her plan. I turned to her and said, Your work is amazing the words leaving a bitter taste in my mouth as I struggled to reconcile the horror of her actions with the undeniable talent she possessed. It was a twisted compliment, born of a twisted reality, where the lines between right and wrong had been blurred beyond recognition. And as I stood there, trapped in the eye of the storm, I knew that I would never be able to escape the darkness that had enveloped us both, a darkness born of pain and betrayal, of loss and longing. But amidst the wreckage of our shattered friendship, there was a glimmer of something else, a twisted bond forged in blood and secrets, bound together by unspeakable truths. 
She took my hands in hers and raised them to her lips, kissing them. We have more work to be done. She said as she let go of my hands and turned to her side, grabbing something shiny from her desk. She turned it to one side and offered it to me. It was a scalpel. I looked at it in her hand, unsure of what to do. A moment later, I found myself accepting the scalpel. And that's how my love of taxidermy grew into something more, something I had never imagined. Victoria and I continue to work on new projects to this day, exploring and experimenting on rare and unusual specimens. Don't worry, every one of them had it coming.